What's up, brand builders? Stephen Hurrahan here on the Brand Master Podcast. And in this episode, I'm joined by Jeremy Miller, marketing strategist, branding expert, speaker, and best selling author of two great books, Sticky Branding and Brand New Name. Now, Jeremy isn't a typical strategist. He fell into branding as a necessity after watching his family business nearly hit rock bottom. He realized that they weren't failing because of their salespeople or their marketing processes, but because of their brand. So he embarked on a decade-long study of how companies grow recognizable and memorable brands. He profiled and interviewed hundreds of companies across dozens of industries, and he put what he learned into action. Now, Jeremy only speaks about branding and marketing ideas that have been tested and applied in the real world, throwing out any ideas that failed to move the needle. So if you want to learn from a top strategist and author who made his way by following what worked and throwing out the rest, then stick around for this episode of the Brand Master Podcast. Welcome to the Brand Master Podcast, show specialized in helping branding professionals and entrepreneurs to build brands using strategy, psychology, and creative thinking. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brand Master Podcast. And I'm absolutely delighted to have on the show with me today, author, Mr. Jeremy Miller. Jeremy, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us today. David, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, I have uh, I came across you uh, quite a while ago. I don't know if you remember, but you and I had some dialogue uh, back and forth uh god i don't know maybe maybe five or or even six years ago um because i came across you through uh through through sticky branding um yep. your book um for for those of of our listeners who don't know who you are or who haven't picked up uh your books which i which i definitely recommend can you give us a a, a bit of a background as to how you arrived at where you are today and what you're up to at the moment Sure. So Sticky Branding is a strategy consulting or growth strategy consulting firm based out of Toronto, Canada. We work with companies around the world on how do you grow your business and brand to the next level. And where Sticky Branding was born was actually out of a family business. I don't have a traditional path into branding and marketing. I actually fell into it out of necessity. I, I joined my family's business when I was in my, my 20s, or, or around 2004, and uh, that first year on the job was just a nightmare. And I thought I was going to take over the world and show my parents a thing or two, and it turns <laughs> out I just got my ass handed to me. And I remember sitting down with my parents at the end of that first year and saying, if this is what it's like to be in a family business, if this is what it's like to be doing this kind of sales and marketing, then... I can't do it. I'm going to go back to the software industry. Life was easier there. You got paid. And <laughs> I got the best advice of my career at that moment. My dad said to me, you know, it's not about the business you've built. It's about the business we're building. What are we going to build next? Mm. And that gave me permission to look at our customers, look at our market, look at the business. And I discovered I didn't have a, a sales problem like I originally thought. I had a branding problem where our mm. business looked like everybody else. And we see chat GPT coming online right now. Well, at that moment, Google was what was transforming our business. The way people found companies in the early 2000s was shifting and, and our business got hit early. And so if you fast forward a little bit, so I, I sold the family business in 2013 and I asked myself, what's the book I wish I had when I went through that experience? Mm. And I wanted to tell the story of how do mid-size privately held businesses, companies like yours and mine that challenge giants of our industry, but we just want to do a great job and have great brands and great customers. How do we do this? And what that ultimately led to was creating sticky branding. Mm. And mm. sticky branding is 12 and a half principles, not only of my company story, but pulling around 250 stories from around the world of successful mid-market companies and the lessons they've learned. And that just has propelled me in the last that's 12 years since writing that book. Uh, it's been a hell of a journey since. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Like, I, I really like that story. And, and, you know, especially that you've come from a completely different industry with no traditional education background. And I, I think a lot of people can relate to that because so many people have shifted their careers at some stage. And I'm certainly someone who did that. I, I was in the finance industry and that was my traditional background. 
and I kind of fell into the industry as well. And I really like the the fact that you know what you built Sticky Branding from. First of all, the principles, then the consultancy was the lessons that you learned along the way. Not because somebody taught you in you know uh, uh, in a book or a lecture hall. It, it was through your own trial and error that brought that about. And and you know I, I really really love that. Uh, how did you stumble upon the importance of brand strategy? Obviously, in looking at your business, you had to ask some serious qu questions, right? Yeah. So it, my career trajectory, like all careers, is squiggly. And I started out in sales. Um, my family, that what we're passionate about is sales. So when the, the Super Bowl happens or Thanksgiving or Christmas, when you talk about football and sports, my family talked about sales. Mm. Uh, and, uh, so that's what I've grown up on and, and no, that's, that's my comfort zone. And, uh, so I started out in sales, then I joined leap job, my family's business, and that was a sales and marketing recruiting agency. And so I went from CRM to HR to say, how do I affect sales performance in that? I kept pushing. So I created a Salesforce design consulting practice. So how do you find the best people? How do you organize them? Brand strategy was essentially the natural element to create effective sales performance that in order to drive an organization, you have to know where you play, how you win, and what's the messaging, the infrastructure, the value proposition, all of the strategic elements are actually what moves the sales needle. So at the core of what sets Sticky Branding apart from other thought leaders and branding uh, gurus and experts, and I don't want to call myself a guru, but if we think of what our philosophy is, it's branding principles that drive sales performance. Mm. Yeah, so I like that because that's there, our lens. There, there's uh, because branding's fu uh, fuzzy, right? You know, yeah. it is this fuzzy concept because it's up in the air. It's all about feelings and connections and perceptions and you know when you when you speak to pure breed marketers who you know live and die by the the metrics and you know entrepreneurs who live and die by the ROI and that's you know that's right the branding becomes a difficult conversation because those uh you know those metrics are are harder to measure They're, it's it's less clear as to exactly you know how brand influences first the marketing message then of course the sales you know it, it is more difficult to track it back but you've you've built a consultancy guiding business owners and entrepreneurs to build a brand based on strategy and you actually see yourself as a brand coach to those clients is that right tell me about your consultancy structure and how you see your role in that in that structure like everything, there's this BCAC moment or before COVID-19, after COVID-19. Mm -hmm. COVID was the true awakening for, for Sticky Branding, where we leveled up in a way that has been transformational for us. And, and so what happened was I grew up in a family business that was in the recruiting sector. We would go up and down with the economy. And so when COVID hit, I realized very quickly that we'd been thrown into a recession. When I say quickly, the first Monday after the travel advisory brand bans, we went to our customers and said, look, we've been thrown into a recession. We could be seeing revenue declines of 30 to 50%. And here's what you need to do. In 08, uh, 09, when uh, the, the recession hit the recruiting business, when the rest of our industry tanked, Leap Job actually grew. And we did that through a rapid process of finding and replacing revenue streams and markets. And so we essentially took that playbook and, and started with that with our clients. And this became a period of just rapid iterations. One of the big ones was strategic planning before the pandemic was very aspirational. So you have a two day offsite workshop, maybe quarterly retreats, leadership coaching. That wasn't going to cut it when jobs were on the line. So we implemented what we call a strategy huddle. So every week we meet our clients at the same time, at the, the, the same, the same time for the same amount of time. So an hour every Tuesday or whatever the, their time slot is. And we meet with them in between those points. But the whole thought here was it was treating strategy as a process and moving fast. And by putting that constant external pressure onto the business it, with a very clear methodology, we were able to affect sales performance very quickly. 
And so that's the guiding light that has shaped sticky branding to this day is that we work with our clients on a continuum and it, it, we, we have a very broad suite of services and topics that we get into, but the mandate is always the same. How do you dr dramatically grow your business by clearly positioning the business, getting a clear sense of where your next customers are going to come from, and then putting in the infrastructure to grow? And if it, one of our, our slogans is, it, it is nothing relieves pressure like sales, that, that we have that sales KPIs, those sales focuses through the lens of strategy and brand. And what that does is it provides the structure to invest in the rest of the business. Yeah, that's brilliant because at the end of the day, uh, you know, sales is what speaks to clients, you know, and, yeah. and if you're able to have a focus on sales through the lens of brand strategy first then marketing strategy then sales it kind of all clicks in and you know it, it, the the sales bit really is the carrot uh for the client because you know at the end of the day that's that's why we're doing what we're doing in the first place now you uh, strategy as i said before especially brand strategy it can be a fluffy topic especially when it comes to providing a strategy as a roadmap and then, you know, uh, providing that to your client to then go off and execute themselves. But you actually take your clients through the execution as well. How do you separate the two? Because you call, uh, you refer to sticky branding as a consultancy, which, you know, traditionally a consultancy is that you provide advice rather than execute for the client, but you do have a focus on strategy execution. Can you talk to me about how you separate the two? So, we bake the two together. So here, the first thing, why is strategy? So to your point on branding is fluffy, 100% agree. I think branding has an identity crisis. Mm -hmm. If you were to go and ask anyone about brand, whatever their lens is, if you're in identity and design, you're going to talk about brand through the lens of identity and design. Mm -hmm. I'm talking through the lens of strategy. To me, I, I take two definitions because I think brand and branding are separate. A brand is a, it, it just take Jeff Bezos' example that, or definition that a brand is what people say when you're not in the room. Well, that's a, a, a past looking, it's what you've done type of definition. Branding is that strategy of where are you going and why? And, and so to take that lens of uh, sales becomes a clarifying element to that. Hmm. This execution though is, I think it's everything actually, because Strategy without execution is just dreaming. So if you don't do what you say you're going to do, then it's useless. And I think that's so much of what the consulting world is. Uh, consultants will run workshops. They will run, speak, keynotes, workshops, write a beautiful plan, and you come back a year later and nothing gets done. If mm -hmm. that's the case, I think that's a failure. So the way we treat execution is one is the continuum that I mentioned before. Work with the client hand in glove every single week so that we're doing what we say we're doing. The other is to put in process for tracking execution. You can do lots of different programs. One of my favorite books is The Four Disciplines of Execution by Franklin Covey. Mm -hmm. And that is have a clear goal, have clear KPIs, weekly huddles. It's a process. And so execution really is two parts. One, it's defining where you're going and doing the work. And the other part of execution is, is not doing the things you said you weren't going to do. So uh, th I think this is where that, so the execution side of it isn't sticky branding or myself creating websites or logo or doing the work for the client. It's working with them to put in the plan, put in the accountability, blocking and tackling to make sure the things you're saying get done, get done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I like that, and I, I think that kind of clears up a little bit of confusion when when you talk about execution, because you know there are so many many different styles of agencies and consultancies out there where you know you could be dealing with a, a consultancy who will do everything from your brand strategy to your Facebook ads and everywhere in between. But when you talk about consultancy and executing on the strategy. You're talking about walking hand in hand with your client 
and making sure that you're there throughout the execution, whoever is handling that execution for them, whether, as I said, it's, it's Facebook ads, it's SEO, the tactical kind of work, you're there with the client overseeing the strategy and, and following through on that. So, so I guess that's the, the, the main difference there. A lot of people see execution as they're doing the thing, they're doing the task, they're doing the Facebook ads and, and things like that. But you can also execute by holding a client's hand and having other people do the actual tactical work on the ground. Now, I, I think I've, of that piece is activation. So I think what the agency work is, is truly activation. Right. Because they're outsourcing chunks to you. Mm. And, and I want to point out something. When you just said that all-inclusive agency, mm. I don't think that actually is an effective model. I think there are some very good, uh, pretty wide agencies that are large and do a lot of great work. But... I think the fundamental issue in marketing is it's so complex, it changes constantly. Mm -hmm. So when Sticky Branding was formed, it was based on this idea of collaboration that we were never going to be experts in everything. So what was the areas that we could be brilliant at and then partner or refer people that were brilliant at the other things, whether that was paid advertising, graphic design, all those activation topics. That's so. Go. So when when it comes to uh, that's <laughs> your cat, is it? Got a cat. Just good show. Up. Sorry about that. Um. Put oh yeah. So so. Hello. <laughs> So when it when it comes to to that side of execution, you would I obviously allow your client to either go with someone who they know, or you would have uh, agencies or or partners in the background who you know do a good job, who you would then refer them to, right? Oh, they'd be in the foreground. So uh, right, uh, the, uh, I've I've just done this with with a client where new website, new paid performance, uh, very specialized. So we had to source new vendors for that, and. Uh, and that was uh, very important for us to uh, to go through that process. Mm -hmm. So the and then the agents we see will ha absolutely have them come into the process because they are part of the execution, part of the team getting done. There's I have zero threat to to beating the f the, the forefront person, and I don't think that's the right way. I think we need to create the infrastructure where everybody is bringing their best foot forward and their best work. Mm. And that's what I found is, is I is an ideal scenario. Um, I don't like the subcontracting control mechanisms. It doesn't actually deliver the best result for the client. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I and I, I completely agree with the the full service world. And I've seen firsthand how a lot of the the you know the the pillars within their business are really treated as as uh, you know little tack-ons or, or add-ons where there's no real special specialization they're they're just following a process that they believe will generate them revenue as a as a priority ahead of delivering for the client now you have a few different very specific philosophies and i really like that because it, it makes things easy to understand for the client and where there's clarity you know that that leads to uh, that leads to sales as well so you you talk about the messaging strategy in the form of your three m's can you talk to us about the the three m's philosophy sure so we did an analysis several years ago to find out what was uh what was the uh the the, the secret sauce because we had these clients that would do uh like we just look actually started with looking at roi that they were doing 20 times roi on our our fee on our annual fee in year and we're like that's insane and we would look at that. They would make multi-million returns. And uh, the uh, and we started saying, why were they so successful? And what it was, it was actually a positioning question that they got really clear about what the next stage of growth was. They And it was that asking the question of who and where are the customers that will drive our next stage of growth. And when they chose and they got really specific and really focused on that, it l led to exponential growth. Mm -hmm. And so as we did this analysis and looked at our customers, we found that uh, that there was really three interlocking questions that shape a strategy, the three M's, market, message, and method. So market, who and where are the customers that will drive your next stage of growth? Mm -hmm. Message, what is the brand messaging and strategy that will provoke a customer to buy? Mm -hmm. And finally, method, 
How do you get the right message in front of the right person at the, with the right call to action so you're driving the business that you need? And when you start to align these, that's really drives exponential growth, but they're hard. So mm. choosing your positioning, who and where are the customers that will drive your growth is a difficult exercise. It takes rest, it takes uh, research, it takes analysis, and it takes making choices of who you are going to go after and who you're going to abandon. It also means turning, saying no to sales in order to get the growth you want. Mm -hmm. And the, the piece that becomes so challenging in that is customer salespeople, especially, they hate to say no. So we had a, a client that went through this whole process and the challenge was the salespeople would come back and say, I found a customer. It's so great. It's amazing. And they would have to go to the owner every single time and hear, no, that's not a fit. They're too small. They're not in this industry and turn them down. And the salespeople were on the verge of revolting and quitting, but it took real strong intestinal fortitude from the perspective of the owner in order to get them to adopt that change. But when they did, it had, uh, they, they grew the business by about 25% in two years. So, uh, mm. fairly substantive change. Mm. The, uh, the, but then you get into your messaging questions again, very difficult. So how do you clarify your messaging? So everyone gets it. How do you, uh, one of the sales models that we prescribe to is provocative selling. So the old sales model was win, win or solution selling. What we want to do is punch a customer. So how do you hit a burning need and speak directly to their challenges with the messaging that will provoke them to buy? Mm. Again, not an easy thing to do, but once you get that with the right market, it's fire. You can close deals. Our, our holy grail is the two call close, being able to close a complex sale in two calls over two weeks. If mm. your brand is that well positioned, it will do that. And then it's scaling. So how do you grow that marketing engine to feed you? And when you get those three M's aligned, this actually starts feeding the organization. And that's actually the gate to opening up the strategy conversation. Most business owners can't get wrapped, their head wrapped around true deep strategy work if they're afraid of not getting the customer's revenue and, and profit to feed the whole organization. It's when that flywheel spinning and they're getting success that allows them to look five and 10 years into the future and start making strategic decisions on the infrastructure they need for growth. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, and so, so when it comes to the method of getting your, um, getting your, your clients brands out there into the world, what does that look like in terms of how you plan that, um, that method? What does that look like? So it changes by business. So you have to really good marketing strategy starts with, with really understanding your customer and their, and their buyer journey. And, but you can short circuit a little bit. So if you were to start in your business, I would look at a set of KPIs in the sales funnel to start. One of the great ones would be, what is the first step that a customer goes through that is a behavioral step to validate intent. In software, that might be the demo. So you get them in, you give them product demo, and now they're in the sales process. You're gonna kick them in or out of the funnel based on how they respond to it. If you're in manufacturing, it might be giving pricing. So a, a price estimate or a quote. From there, you probably have the, the demo, the proposal, negotiating close will be those steps afterwards. But that pivotal first step, that quote, the demo, what are the steps that lead up to that? You start working backwards incrementally. Mm. The reason I do that when you start from the behavior they're trying to influence is it keeps you away from bandwagon marketing. Mm. So a lot of organizations get into social media and, and search marketing and all these things, and they start putting out there. And it's very easy to find an agency who will gladly sell you a program and do the work for oh, you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But if if you don't actually know how the customer got to that behavior you're trying to influence, mm -hmm. then it's kind of like throwing darts at the wall. It's that old adage that 50% of my marketing works. I just don't know which. It's the discipline. So understanding your customer and how they found you is remarkable. We mm -hmm. had one client uh, that was spending $20,000 a month in paid performance marketing 
and with a terrible customer acquisition cost. And they went and they looked down all of their customers and where their best clients were coming from. And 100% of those came through referrals from three major distributors. And it went, it dawned on them that they could redirect 100% of their, uh, their ad budget into those three accounts. And A, they would drive their costs down, but they would increase and get better quality customers out of the people that are sending them their best customers. And it's awesome. So you often simplify it just because I always think of it this way. Clarity allows you to make better choices. And if you don't have clarity, then you're probably spinning. There's something there you need to dig on a little bit further. Mm. And, and look, it's it's uh, when you speak to clients it's and you, you hear their stories, it's so easy to understand how uh, how many clients, especially in the small business world, get mis misled because there's so much information out there telling them that they need to do Facebook ads or they need to do TikTok ads or they need to do YouTube ads or this, that, and the other. And, and they get kind of sucked into this tactical approach without really having had having considered the bigger questions and the, the strategic questions that will really help them to to make those choices. So you know, it's there. There is a big education gap to close, but I don't think it will ever be closed because this industry is is so wide, it's so broad, it's so confusing. So, um, you know, starting with those questions is uh, is super important. Now, when it comes to the marketing strategy side of things, because we've got brand strategy, and I like to to uh, think of brand and marketing as the method and the mode. Um, but when it comes to to uh, marketing strategy, you actually have a, a a specific approach you you work with with accelerators you work with a, a brand accelerator a marketing accelerator and a sales accelerator can you tell me how those accelerators work and how that forms the structure of, of what you do for your clients one of the things we found through covid was that you couldn't you didn't have time for planning and thinking you had to act we had to get cash we had to get revenue and people's jobs were on the line, the discipline of, of executing smart, aggressively, and fast was essential. And so what happened was we flipped the process. So normally you would start out at that brand strategy of mission, vision, values, positioning, competitive advantage, all that kind of stuff. But if you need sales now, then that's the last thing you're actually going to do. So sales accelerator mm -hmm. is, is a validation idea. So it is validating, do your customers buy? So do you have the right offer for the right customers? Is the messaging work? When you get in front of them, does a salesperson or yourself able to navigate that and push it forward? If you can go out and pitch, pitch, pitch and go nowhere, there's no point in doing marketing. So what we want to do in a sales accelerator is rapidly validate the brand messaging and story works. If it doesn't sell, we don't move forward. If it sells, then it becomes a leveling up. And Marketing Accelerator really focuses on building a demand generation strategy. What are the tactics or what is the methods by which customers buy? And then choosing how you're either going to put yourself in the path of search, whether that's through paid or organic or whatever tactic you choose, or is it through referral? So what are your centers of influence and how are they going to move? Or finally, it, you might look at it through other modes like uh, brand awareness, sponsorship. The But when you understand the sales process and how the customer is buying, it gives you a, a foundation to choose the marketing tactics. And I think that's really mm -hmm. a key point to the mode is in a world of so many choices and not all of them work, being deliberate on your marketing budget and how you're going to affect sales performance is really choosing which tactics within your budget are you going to pull in order to drive uh, to get to those customers? And the measure of success is going to be inquiries. So I can't tell you in, in this kind of a, a podcast environment which tactic to choose other than use your sales process to choose the tactics that will make the most difference. Mm -hmm. And and then and then obviously you've got your brand accelerator. So you you obviously you build on each. So the sales accelerator informs the marketing accelerator, which informs the brand accelerator. Is that right? So brand strategy is the last piece, and and often 
in a small business, let's say uh, um, a five to 10 person company, you might not ever actually get the true brand strategy. Mm. And, and the reason for that is you're just focusing on the incremental growth of sales. Branding as a topic really isn't super relevant until you start crossing around $10 million and you're scaling your reputation and your awareness down, not only across your employees and team, but into the market. It's it, it, it the, the, the idea that you need to have a Nike esque brand as a solopreneur is, is doesn't make any sense. Your personal brand is probably going to carry you quite far. So the, uh, the reason that brand strategy starts coming last is this is the communication of where you're going and organizing your teams. And what a, a brand strategy starts to do is look across horizons. And I think this is actually the, the real reason why strategy gets complex. There's the stuff you need to do right now, but strategy is about planning. So if you imagine this, you've got a, a two ton boulder that you want to move from here to there. And in that you have to choose the tactic. So you could get a bunch of guys and put your shoulder into it, or you could devise a pulley system and you get on a flatbed and you move it. Well, the method by which you move the rock to the destination is your strategy. You chose an outcome, you chose how you're going to do it, and then you did it. And so what strategy gets complicated on is there's three time horizons. You have your 10 year vision. Where are you going and why? What's that big, hairy, audacious goal? Or if everything came together, what would your business look like in 10 years? You have an investment horizon of say three to five years. So what does your business need to invest in in order to have the infrastructure to get there? And then finally, it's the in-year plan. What do you need to do right now to advance the business? And the problem with it, if you don't have the midterm plan, your, your in-year planning can be very frenetic. You're just doing stuff, but you don't know which choices to make because in the moment you might make the right choice, but without that plan of how you're going to affect it, it's literally like being the group of guys, just putting your shoulder into the rock and brute force and learning along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, it's an interesting point that uh, you 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 put brand at the end, and and uh, it's it's kind of an inverse approach to to the way a lot of people um, approach it. And I've actually heard Don Miller, um, uh, the author of Story Brand, um, have that perspective as well that brand and brand strategy is not something that that um, that many brands should look at before uh, a certain revenue um, point. In terms of your sales validation, because I find that that's super interesting as well, because obviously if you're able to validate sales and you get the, the, the ball rolling in terms of uh, revenue, you also confirm to the client that you know what you're doing because you're helping them to generate uh, sales. What does that look like in terms of that sales validation, that, that kind of guerrilla, low-budget approach to, to validating those sales? Do you see a worksheet on our... Our website stickybranding.com called the offer messaging stack and it's a, a free tool that anyone could download mm -hmm. but in the oms what we're really looking at is the burning need so what is a customer's burning need either a known or unknown need that they are trying to solve and in provocative selling what we're trying to do is find a way to provoke a customer to create budget especially if you're in a downturn or COVID you don't have time to be building a, a three-year relationship to, to sell. Mm. So when you get to a burning need, you can then create what we call uh, an offer messaging stack, which is, is your sales pitch. And we break it down into the building blocks. So a hypothesis, what is that catch that you want to get someone to, to hook on? What is the thing that you are offering in terms of your solution? Value delivered, we break it up into left brain, right brain, and a call to action. And when you break it down, you can start tweaking it in very deliberate ways, which then can be put into a campaign, whether it's an email letter, a, uh, a Facebook ad, whatever you choose to be the delivery mode at that point. But by breaking it down, you, you get to, to something that might work. So let me just give you an example. Uh, Central Smith is an ice cream manufacturer and through COVID, their core market restaurants 
basically disappeared. Mm. And so we had to say, okay, how do we activate this market? So we started looking at the, at the restaurants and we discovered that need that they had, which was an unknown need, is they didn't have dessert options on their takeout menus. Most restaurants mm. didn't know that having a frozen dessert, ice cream or, or a plant-based uh, frozen dessert could be delivered through Uber or skip the dishes or, or whatever platform you chose. Mm -hmm. And so, but they needed it because they were trying to serve customers in a very different way. So we created this pitch. The hypothesis was, was since the start of COVID, retail ice cream sales are up 200%. Ice cream is the new toilet paper. Have you considered a takeout option on your menu? The solution was single serve ice cream cups branded to the restaurant. The value delivered was on an ROI basis was to increase the average order size. So it was profit per, per order. And the right brain was it would delight the customer. It was kid friendly, custom flavors, brand uh, centric. And the call to action was a discovery session. So we wrote a little email that was based on that. And it went out to 50 VPs of sales of quick serve restaurants and restaurant groups. And from there, they had a 70% response rate. That ice cream is the new toilet paper just was a beautiful hook. And of that, they landed a Wales, uh, a company that did f uh, an order of 500,000 units a year in the first five weeks. And in five months, they landed their second whale doing 20 million units a year. And it came in in being really clear and provocative. You've just been affected by COVID. Your in-store dining is, is affected. Are you looking at expansions and product expansions on your takeout menu? Let's have a business conversation. This mm -hmm. isn't actually that complicated, but we get caught up in all the, the BS type of marketing of beautiful words and blah, blah, blah. But this was just highly practical, business oriented, sell high, see if it works. Mm -hmm. And after every sales call, we had the sales reps complete what's called a win loss card, which is a survey. Each one of those cards doesn't tell us much, but once you start seeing 10 of them, you validate results. Mm. Are you getting common objections, common questions? What is resonating? And that becomes the basis for marketing because now we've validated that we have an offer that people want to buy. We know the core messaging that's going to resonate with them. We have the data to show objections that we can build FAQs or, or search content marketing. And you can just start building all the way from there simply on selling a deal in 90 days. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, and you know, the 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 process of validating one to feed into the other to 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 then keep that iterative process going um you know makes sense. And for any business owner um who wants to see immediate results, it allows them to kind of be down in the dirt rather than up in the clouds to to kind of paraphrase uh you know Gary V's um favorite uh, favorite thing to to talk about but um in, in terms of that uh the 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 process itself that that you bring those clients through do you look for a specific type of business to work with a certain benchmark in terms of their revenue you know to to start this process with sticky branding what would a business have to be doing I, I think that's a great question. So our customers are quite diverse. We work across multiple industries, but I would say uh, our clients are uh, B2B, selling B2B complex products or services. They're established companies, so they have an existing product, they have existing customers. And what's really driving is, is that ambitious desire to grow. Mm. Uh, the range is pretty broad. I, I often say it's from 1 million to 100 million. Uh, but our smallest clients are in that, say, half a million or less, 250K range. We have a funded startup. We have a husband and wife team. Uh, and why are they investing in this? Is that they don't just want to be a small business or a solopreneur. They want to grow to a million. They want to go to 5 million. And they want that, that journey to go forward. And so what we have found within our clients is that they are those ambitious entrepreneurs and business owners uh, that are making that commitment to grow that sticky brand, that brand where people know them, like them, trust them, and choose them first at a, at a brand level. 
but they know that's just not lipstick on a pig. It's actually, you have to have a brilliant business that you're in order to have a brilliant brand, you have to have a brilliant business. Mm -hmm. And so it's the journey and the art artistry is really building that, that company to, to continually level up. And that's a journey. Uh, uh, the average client retainer for sticky branding right now is three years and growing that um, we, we only deliver our work on a month to month basis, but our clients continue to grow with us because they get the results they want. Awesome. That's uh, it, it's, it's, it's a beautiful concept as well, because uh, there, you know, there are a lot of professionals in the branding world who believe that, you know, they have to target, um, you know, startups with very little budget because the start startups are, are the ones that don't have a brand and need a brand. Whereas there are so many businesses out there who have what they believe is a brand, but really they have problems on different levels and you can approach it from so many different levels from a brand perspective, from a marketing perspective and from a sales perspective as, as you clearly do. It, it's been an absolute pleasure, Jeremy. Um, I'm sure so many listeners are going to get a ton of value from this in terms of not just their own approach to their brand, but their own approach to consulting and offering service, uh, services as well, and how you can kind of dissect how you can do that in a very effective way. If somebody wants to get a hold of you now, you obviously have a number of books. Um, you've, um, You've got your sticky branding book and your brand naming book. Um, do you have you have you written any any more since then? Is there anything else in the pipeline? Oh man, you just put more work on my plate. <laughs> the, the brand new names only like came out twenty nineteen. Can I breathe for a moment? <laughs> uh, Take a minute. The, no, there's just the two books: sticky branding and brand new name. There is more in the the funnel. Uh, the website. The easiest way to find me is just Google sticky branding. Uh, uh, all of our our, our 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 names on social media, Sticky Branding, the website, stickybranding.com. And in addition to the, the the two books available on Amazon are a number of free guides on our website. And just to anyone who's listening, if you have questions, you want to chat about anything, DM me. I'm very accessible. You can hit me on LinkedIn or send an email to, to me directly off of the Sticky Branding website. We're more than happy to chat anytime. Jeremy, it's been an absolute pleasure, my man. Uh, I hope to do it again soon. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Awesome. Thanks for having me. We really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. If you want to learn more brand strategy techniques to level up your skills, make sure you check out brandmasteracademy.com. There's plenty of free resources and premium content for you to download and get you going. If you'd like to join our Facebook group full of like-minded brand strategists, all learning from each other, then find us by searching for the Brand Strategy Community, where you can find exclusive content for members as well. If you enjoyed this content, please be sure to give us an honest review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listened, and make sure you tune in for the next episode of the Brand Master Podcast.